Good evening everyone and welcome. My name is Isaac Gilmer and beside me are Carol Gilmer and Kevin Lynch, both active members of Yes Kelty. Uh, we're here tonight and are campaigning for independent Scotland because we believe we'll bring a more prosperous society and suited to the needs of Scotland. Uh, tonight we're hearing from Tommy Sheridan and listening to his views and opinions on the issues that we're faced with today. Uh, Tommy has previously been a prominent figure in campaigns against poll tax and the bedroom tax, as well as campaigning on behalf of pensioners, the disabled, striking workers and those fighting for nuclear disarmament. There will be time then for some questions uh, and com comments from the audience, but for now, let's go a warm welcome to Tommy Sheridan. Can I start off, folks, with a, an apology to each and every one of you? Um, my inability to follow instructions um, when I'm driving is legendary. Um, I'm also worried about this mic uh, going to be fine. Um, so, oh, it's there you go, get somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, so, I apologise for being late, folks. I got lost. It's just as simple as that. I got lost and I had to get somebody from the Kingdom of Fife to come and get me and, uh, and bring me here. So, apologies and I, I hope you'll accept that. Can I also just by way of um, kicking off say that I'm very pleased to have a, a special um, guest here um, tonight uh, in relation to the daughter of, of a woman, um, Elaine uh, Smith, who some of you may have already seen a, a, a video that, that was done in Kakodi, um, it was done in January. And it was a speech that I gave, and I dedicated that speech to Elaine, who was a cancer sufferer, but was a hell of a fighter. Um, and her spirit was just unconquerable. Unfortunately, her life was taken by cancer, and, and we never get the, the chance to become the friends that we hopefully were going to become. Uh, and I dedicated that um, speech to Elaine, and her, and her daughter was very pleased. I described her as a, a fighting Fife woman, and she's very pleased that 125,000 people so far have now seen that speech and seen that dedication to Elaine. So, I uh, very much welcome uh, Elaine's uh, daughter here tonight. I'm hoping tonight, brothers and sisters, that we can discuss Scotland's future. We can discuss what the 18th of September referendum actually means. I'd like to kick off by outlining what it's not about. Because 18th of September has got nothing whatsoever to do with the SNP as a political party. I have to say that I take my hat off to the SNP for the way they've kept the issue of independence on the political agenda over many years, and I take my hat off to them. But I'm not in the SNP. I don't generally vote for the SNP. Voting yes in September 18th is not an endorsement of the SNP. And it is not an endorsement either of Alec Salmond. Some people in here tonight will like Alec Salmond. Some people in here tonight will dislike Alec Salmond. Some people in here tonight are probably neutral about Alec Salmond. The point is the vote on 18th of September has got nothing to do with Alex Salmon. 18th of September is about the future of Scotland. It's about whether Scotland is going to be responsible enough, courageous enough, to stand up and be counted as an independent country in its own right. That's what the 18th of September is all about. And I've heard in all the meetings I've been doing, I'm very, very pleased to be travelling the country speaking at meetings all over Scotland. And I hear constantly, usually at the start of the meetings rather than the end of the meetings, but I hear constantly, I'm no voting SNP, I don't like it. I'm no voting yes, I don't like Alex Hammond. I'm no voting yes, I don't like the SNP. And I use a wee scenario, a wee analogy that I would like to put to you here tonight. If any of you ever get the opportunity and the wherewithal, and it's getting harder and harder to buy a wee house. And you go and visit this wee house, and it's got a lovely garden. And it's got three smashing bedrooms. It's got a sitting room, it's got a big kitchen, double glazed, central heated. It is perfect. 
but you don't like the decoration. And you say, ah, oh, I'm not going to buy it because I don't like the decoration. That is as ridiculous as it is to suggest that you're not going to vote yes on 18th of September because you don't like Alex Salmon or because you don't like the SNP. Because what the 18th of September is about is the start of our journey, not the end of our journey. And what you will be able to decide in 2016, two years from now, is who it is you want to run an independent Scotland. 18th of September is not about who runs Scotland. 18th of September is about the right to run Scotland. That's what the 18th of September is all about. It's about saying loud and clear, and I have to be a wee bit conditional here. Somebody did say to me at a meeting, it might even have been the Kakodi meeting, that I'd went a wee bit far. Because I had suggested that a yes vote on the 18th of September would mean we would never ever have a Tory government in Scotland again. <laughs> and somebody did pull me up via Twitter. He said, Tony, you have to be careful, you know. This, the Tories have got around about 18% of the vote sometimes in Scotland. You know, you can't say we'll never have a Tory government again. So I'm going to change what I said. And I'm going to say, we will never, ever have a Tory government in Scotland unless the people of Scotland vote for a Tory government. That's the point. That's the point. And there is no chance of hell freezing over than the people of Scotland voting for a Tory government. That's the reality. So what we're saying here is that the 18th of September is giving us the right to decide our future. You see, in the car coming here tonight, Elaine was talking about her memory of the battle against the poll tax. And she says, my mum always had time for you, Tommy, because you're one guy that was prepared to go to jail against the poll tax. And I said, well, <coughs> we might... We thought it was worth fighting the poll tax. And when it's worth fighting for something, sometimes it's unfortunately the case that you need to get your liberty to fight it. And Jerry, who was the driver, said, Aye, but you've not told her that he's managed to get rid of warrant sales, which is why you were in jail. Now, some of you might not know this, but warrant sales were used as a weapon to frighten and embarrass working class people who couldn't afford to pay the poll tax. They have been used for hundreds of years. Robbie Burns called for the end of warrant sales. Keir Hardney, the first of a manifesto, 1888 of the Independent Labour Party, had the abolition of warrant sales in his manifesto. There's a long tradition of the working class being against the right for debtors to go into somebody's house forcibly and take their furniture out because they couldn't afford to pay a bill. They tried it with the poll tax. And hundreds and thousands of people, the length and breadth of Scotland, said, no, you're no doing it. They lined up outside people's houses, people they'd never met. They lined up and they said, we're not letting you in. And the sheriff officers couldn't get in. Simple as that. And then what happened? Then what happened in September of 1991? This is after they'd announced, by the way, that the poll tax was getting scrapped. They announced via a phone call that we got in our office, lone parent for Greenock returned from shopping one afternoon to find a note on her door to say that she was to go down to the local sheriff office, Abernethy McIntyre, and pick up the new keys because her door had been forced open, a new lock had been installed, she was to be charged for it, and they'd taken a coffee table, a display cabinet, and a television. They'd taken out her house when she wasn't in air because she couldn't afford to pay the poll tax. And they were going to have a warrant sale on the 1st of October 1991 in Glasgow. Well, we were there for that. So we organised and we had about three or four hundred people turned up that morning. We surrounded the van, a big blue van with the two sheriff officers inside it. The warrant sale was supposed to start at 11am. We were there for 7am. 
At 10 minutes to 11, a police officer took a loud hailer and announced the warrant sale was off because you couldn't guarantee the safety of the sheriff officers because they couldn't go to the van. <laughs> I've got to say to you, that was right because what they were about to do was wrong. They were about to embarrass a wee lassie who couldn't afford to pay a bill. They were about to embarrass her for the crime of being poor. We stopped it. A wee bit further than that, the day before it, I got a wee things put through the door. I, lived, I got brought in a tenement building, the floor of the tenement building. And I was in this day and I heard something at the door. And at the time I got to the door, there was nobody there. But when I looked out the veranda, I saw a, a big Peugeot 405, big red one with two guys with suits, in the car driving away. And then I picked up this big brown envelope. And inside this big brown envelope, there was a letter that was telling me that I had been interdicted. Interdicted, and I wasn't allowed to go to the warrant sale. Me or anybody else were only allowed to go to this warrant sale. So I had a choice to make, because we've all got in life, all got choices to make. And I thought, well, am I going to agree with this interdict and no go? Or am I going to go there and defy the interdict? So, as you know, um, I don't tend to like rules and regulations, so I went anyway, and when we were at the warrant sale, I tore it up and I said, listen, this piece of paper is supposed to stop us all from being here, but we are here to stop the warrant sale, we're stopping it. And we did it. And everybody said, that's great, well done. A week later, I got a letter saying that I was going to take to the High Court for contempt of court. This was apparently a very important wee piece of paper that I dripped up. <laughs> and uh, I was getting done for a flagrant, flagrant contempt of court. Went to see my lawyer, a guy called Alan Miller, who's now the Professor of Human Rights at Strathclyde University, met in the Centurion Cafe in the Glasgow Cross, and Alan says, don't worry, Tommy. People break into dicks all the time. Said, don't worry, you've got to be slapped to this. I said, that's no, great then. <laughs> Two weeks later, he contacted me and says, Tommy, I was wrong. Um, they're gone for 12 months. <laughs> But then you'd be rioting as well. <laughs> as it happens, when we got the High Court case in Edinburgh, the uh, eagle-eyed Alan Muller managed to make up for his earlier gaffe when he spotted the CCTV that the police were using as their evidence against me. And they spotted that one of the guys in the crowd who actually threw a punch and started the battle of a car was also given evidence with a police uniform on. <laughs> and um, Alan said he wants some recalled and the PF said okay okay we'll drop the rioting charge we're just doing them with breach of an interdict and I get six months in jail <clears throat> the moral of that story brothers and sisters is I get six months in jail in 1992 in 1999 seven years later I got elected to the Scottish Parliament and the first the first bill that was passed in the Scottish Parliament was the abolition of warrant sales bill. Very good. Because I may have been a wee guy with a leather jacket getting arrested in the Tumble Street incident and stopping the warrant sales, but this time I was empowered in Parliament and was able to stand up and move a piece of legislation that actually changed the law. We changed the law to stop anybody else being embarrassed by the threat of a warrant seal. And what that story shows you is that the Scottish Parliament in and of itself was something that's positive. Because for hundreds of years politicians said they were going to get rid of warrant seals. Within less than six months of the Scottish Parliament we had passed the abolition of warrant seals bill. That's what was important about that Parliament. But then, here's the limitation, then we had the advent of the illegal, deceptive war in Iraq. And if anybody thinks it was about weapons of mass destruction, or anybody thinks it was about Saddam Hussein being a dictator or a tyrant, I would say, wake it up and smell the oil. <laughs> That's what the Iraq war was all about. And in the Scottish Parliament, many of us, many of us were saying, no way are we going to be involved in an illegal war. No way are we going to have our kids 
who have joined the army, many of them economic conscripts to the army because there's nothing for them in Civvy Street. Join the army to get a train. Join the army to get a training. Join the army, yes, they're supposed to defend the country. But they're supposed to defend the country if the country's under attack. They're not supposed to invade other countries on a false premise of lies and deceit. So we stood up in that parliament and we voted against the Iraq war. And Westminster says, we don't care, we're sending the troops. That's the limitation in the Scottish Parliament. That's why I say to you in 18th of September, don't accept this parental guidance parliament of going to Edinburgh now, that you can only do certain things. High hedges bill, dog fouling bill, important. I want to do more than that. I want to stop any other kids going to any other illegal, illegal wars. I want to get rid of the most expensive scrap metal in the world. The scrap metal that's based at Trident. That's never going to get used because if it gets used, then the world is blown up. The planet is finished. Why then would you store them? Why are we spending 2.1 Billion pounds every year. Two pounds, that's your share, that's Scotland's share of maintaining the nuclear arsenal at Fasley. 2.1 billion pounds. I've got a wee uh, piece of paper here that tells you. There it's there. Five hospitals, 100 doctors, 100 dentists, 10 secondary schools, 200 teachers, 30 sports centres, host the Commonwealth Games, dual the A96 Inverness to Aberdeen, dual the A90 Inverness. That could be done with one year's expenditure. Yeah. One year's expenditure. <laughs> That's climate. Our choice, our choice as a people, is do we want to continue to fund a weapon of mass destruction which is illegal and immoral, or do we want to build more hospitals, more schools, provide more doctors, more nurses, more teachers? That's what this debate's all about. What type of Scotland do you want to live in, brothers and sisters? Is it a Scotland that prioritises weapons of mass destruction? Or is it a Scotland that prioritises hospitals and schools? That's the choice that you've got on the 18th of September. We are a nation. What we don't have is the right to act as a nation. 18th of September gives us that opportunity. You know, you look at what the no campaign's all about. What have they got in their armory? What have they got to offer you? Fear. That's all they've got. They want to frighten you. You're not big enough. You're not strong enough. You're not intelligent enough. That's what they're telling you. Brothers and sisters, we're here tonight. To promote hope over fear. The hope of a new and a better Scotland. They tell you, you're not financially viable. In the last 32 years. Not the last two years. In the last 32 years in a row. Scotland has raised more in tax and revenues than we've received back from Westminster. We've given them more than they've given us back. We're starting, therefore, not on the basis of a deficit. We're starting on the basis of a surplus. We have an economy which is independently capable of all of the countries in the world that have secured their independence. Scotland is better economically than any of those other countries were at the time that they secured their independence. That's the reality of the situation. They tell us you should be worried about pensions. You should be worried about social security. Why would you worry about pensions and social security when independent Scotland when the whole political ethos, the whole political consensus in Scotland is left of centre? It's not about cutting benefits, it's about improving benefits. It's not about cutting pensions, it's about giving pensioners bus passes, free elderly care, improving the treatment of our pensioners. That's the political ethos in Scotland, it's not the political ethos in Westminster. 
They tell us, worry about your health service. I ask you to go online, go on YouTube, and listen to the consultant of over 15 years experience speak about the situation regarding the health service. The health service where she says, if we don't vote for independence, then in five years' time, our health service will be under the same pressure that the health service in England is under, where they're privatising it here and now. And within ten years' time, she predicts we will no longer have a public health service. That's the reality. So see if you really want a reason to vote yes on 18th September. I ask you, do you believe in a public health service? Because if you do, the only vote for you is a vote yes. Do you believe in peace? Do you believe in spending billions of pounds on schools and doctors and hospitals instead of nuclear weapons? Then vote yes on the 18th of September. Do you believe in democracy? Do you believe that a country should get the government that it votes for? Is that too much to ask the 21st century? That you actually get the government you vote for? That's what voting yes is all about. And brothers and sisters, when they say, oh, but where we man it, you can't be sure of the future. Okay, put your hands up and say, right, okay. We can't give you certainties. We can't give you dotting of eyes and crossing of every T. We can give you the general perspective, the general direction that things are moving. Scotland is a communitarian country. Scotland is a country that believes in public services. Scotland's a country that says we're not going to privatise the mail service and independence, we're going to keep it public. Scotland's a country that is about values. Community values. Public service values. I've got to say to you, unfortunately, I don't mean the whole of England, but that's not the consensus of Westminster. Westminster is about privatisation. Westminster is about feeding the avarice and the greed of the rich. They say to us, you know, they say to us, we should all tighten our belts. We have to accept the cuts in public services. We have to accept the reductions in elderly care. We have to accept that hospitals can't perform the number of operations that they would like to. We have to accept that we don't have enough for cancer research. We have to rely on charity. We have to rely on people collecting out in the street for cancer care, for cancer research. Brothers and sisters, I tell you what I want an independent Scotland. You're looking for visions of an independent Scotland. Here's my vision of an independent Scotland. My vision of an independent Scotland is there will be people collecting in the street and they'll be shaking their wee tins in front of you and they'll be saying, go to give us a wee donation and they might even have wee stickers. But you know what the sticker will be? It'll be of a nuclear bomb. And it'll say, God, it is a wee collection because we're trying to raise enough money for nuclear weapons. Because we here in Scotland, we've abolished them. We're not funding them because we are investing in cancer research. We're investing in our health service. We're investing in the things that matter to people. And nuclear weapons don't matter to anybody. That's the reality. That's the vision of a Scotland that we could have if we're only prepared to reach out and grab it. You know, they tell us that we're all in the same boat. You know, here they we're all in it together, they say. Well, here's a wee report here. I, I couldn't help but notice this wee report. It's the rich list. And they've now discovered that the one thousand richest people in Britain have now got an astronomical amount of wealth. It's the amount of wealth, by the way, I'm going to give you a figure here and you're going to say, what does that mean? Right? Because the one thousand people have between them 518 billion pounds. That's 518,000 million pounds among one thousand people. You know that amounts to one third of the gross domestic product of the whole of Britain. That, that, that amounts to one third of every good and every service that's produced in Britain. One thousand people. The guy who does this survey, he's done it since 1989. You used to have to have a million pounds to get into the rich list. 
Now if you've not got 85 million pounds, you can't get into the rich list. He says that it is the biggest increase in wealth that has ever been recorded in one single year. A 15.7% increase in the wealth of the rich. But we're all in it together. You are all sharing the pain, aren't we? We're all in it together, brothers and sisters. Unless you're filthy rich. Unless you're pals of the millionaires who run the government. You've got a cabinet down there of 29 members. 23 out of the 29 are personal millionaires. What do they know about poverty? What do they know about low pay? What do they know about zero hours contracts? What do they know about things like the bedroom tax? They know butter all about it. Because they live in a different planet. They effectively are political space cadets. That's what they are. They are out of touch with the reality of ordinary people. Because cheek by jewel, cheek by jewel, by the increase in wealth and the rich, there you've got the truth. Poverty increased in the first year of the coalition government by 900,000. 900,000, also a, almost a million more people driven into poverty. And 80% of them are workers. This is the people we're talking about. On benefit, we're talking about the working poor. Because pay is so low. While rents and mortgages and food prices and fuel and everything else has gone up. Up, all that's happening is people are standing still and they are getting cast aside into poverty. 300,000 Merwains living in poverty. And this report goes on to say that the real cuts haven't even begun yet. They haven't even begun yet. They're predicting in the next nine months there's going to be another 100,000 Wains in Scotland alone driven into poverty under the austerity cuts. Austerity. What is austerity? Austerity is punishing the poor for the crimes of the rich. That's what austerity is. I ask you, in relation to the financial crisis that we're facing, I ask you to name me one benefit claimant, one pensioner, one low-paid worker who's responsible for the economic mess we're in. And the answer is none of them are responsible. Well, brothers and sisters, if none of them are responsible for the economic mess, why the hell are they having to pay for the economic mess? That's the reality of the economic. We have an opportunity here on the 18th of September to say to those charlatans down in Westminster who think they can get away with privatising everything, promoting the rich, Tax cuts for the millionaires, that's what they've introduced. They introduced tax cuts for the millionaires in the same month that they introduced the bedroom tax. The bedroom tax which was designed to attack those who were already poor. Because who did it affect? It affected those that were receiving housing benefit. In the same month that they introduced bedroom tax, they cut rich taxes by 5%. Millionaires in this country are £100,000 a year better off because of tax cuts. But we're all in it together. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, 91% of Scotland's elected politicians voted against the bedroom tax. We still got the bedroom tax. Are we going to continue to allow ourselves to be having things foisted upon us that we never voted for? You see, I make a point in these meetings that 18th of September is about voting for freedom. And some people sometimes think, are you over egg in the pudding? You know, you're talking about freedom. We're not exactly in chains. We're not exactly locked up. Believe you me, I know a thing or two about being locked up. <laughs> are you right to mention freedom? Brothers and sisters, wouldn't it be nice to be free? To vote for the government that you actually end up getting. Mm -hmm. That's what we mean by freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom 
to save the health service. Freedom to get rid of nuclear weapons. Freedom to introduce a living wage instead of a poverty minimum wage. Freedom to give our pensioners a decent standard of life instead of struggling to make ends meet. Freedom, from my perspective, this isn't in the white paper. We're not voting for the white paper. We're voting for visions. We're voting for a future. Freedom in an independent Scotland to do what most other countries in the world do with our energy resources. Why should we have this electricity that you've got on here for these lights? Why should it be owned and controlled by some private individual that makes money out of you every time you turn your lights on? Why should you go home the night and put on the gas fob and put money in somebody's pocket because you're putting a gas fob? It's ridiculous. Those essentials of life should not be privately owned for private profit. They should be publicly owned for the benefit of all of the public. That's what we want in an independent Scotland. In an independent Scotland, the gas, the electricity, the trains, and the oil, and the oil. I don't want an independent Scotland that continues to make billionaires from America even richer. I want to do what they do in the Arab countries that everybody talks about. Oh, how beautiful the roads are, how beautiful the buildings are. Oh, there's always construction going on in these countries. Why? Because they own their bloody oil and they use the revenue for public works programs. Wouldn't it make sense in this independent Scotland that we look at the problems we've got, like a lack of housing. Why don't we use the revenue from gas and electricity and oil to invest in public programs to build decent houses for people? And when you build decent houses, you need to cut the rock for the quarries. You need to make the bricks. You need to make the cement. You need the joiners. You need the brick layers. You need the surveyors. In other words, you create jobs. You create thousands of jobs. And what happens when you create jobs? I was very, very lucky as a youngster at 17 years of age to go to, Str to, go to Stirling University. Very lucky. Didn't know why I was gone. My mom told me I was gone, and that was it. <laughs> Once I got there, I sort of uh, discovered what it was all about. But I, I learned during my economics degree, I learned a wee thing called the marginal propensity to consume. And it sounds like a mouthful. But it's actually very, very simple. What it means is, in economic theory and reality, if you give an extra pound a week to a millionaire, he doesn't spend it because he's already got enough money. He stores it, puts it in the bank. It's unproductive. You give an extra pound a week to somebody who's low paid, he'll spend the whole pound. That's what the marginal propensity to consume is all about. The more people you put in employment, then the more goods and services those people buy. And the more goods and services those people buy, the greater demand there is for the supply of those goods and services. You have what's called a virtuous economic cycle. So that by creating jobs, you create more jobs. That's what we can do in an independent school. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to finish my remarks. I've already spoke for too long. I apologise for shouting. And, uh, <laughs> I apologise for shouting and, and going over the top. I'm passionate about this. And, and, and therefore, I can't help it. But I'm going to ask each and every one of you, particularly the uh, grey-haired bunch among us, those who used to have the flowing follicles, who are now challenged in that area, most of you will have either children and some of you will have grandchildren. I'm going to ask you to think here and now. What type of Scotland is it that you want your kids and your grandkids to grow up in? Is it the type of Scotland where it looks like, according to the opinion polls, that the Tories are going to win the next election? The type of Scotland where you have got people in Parliament from racist parties like UKIP, because that's what's going to happen at the next election, determining the future. 
for your wins? Or do you want a Scotland where the priority is its people? The priority are the kids and the pensioners. That's the table of Scotland. I want to live in, brothers and sisters, and that's why I'm dead passionate about this. That's why I'm going to every part of Scotland I can get invited to, to try and promote this message. Because we, in many respects, 50 years of age, we've had half a century. I want to think of the wings coming up now. What are they going to have in the next half century? What are they going to be living in? You know, I often finish these meetings by referring to a quote from a very famous and hard and committed trade unionist in Ireland, the guy who was the leader of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, who in 1913 was involved in a mammoth industrial dispute against the dockers. The dock labourers were getting treated like shit, hired and fired day by day. The employers thought that they could do with the dockers what they wanted. And they could, because they weren't organised. People like Jim Larkin of the Irish Transport General Workers Union got them organised and they were involved in a massive dispute for recognition for the union in 1913. It became known as the Dublin Lockout. They took the employers to the edge. They had nothing, but they had justice on their side. And what we've got here is we've got the quote of Jim Larkin to inspire us. As Jim Larkin said, the powerful only appear so because we are on our knees. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask each and every one of you, get up off your knees. Get up off your knees and realise what is your destiny. To stand up and be a proud, small country that puts people before profit and looks after their kids and their pensioners, not the development of nuclear weapons. Please, use your vote on the 18th of September for your own future, but more important of all, for the future of your kids and your grandkids. Vote yes on the 18th of September. Thanks very much.